uh, have to explain what's going on here. <laughs> um, show pictures now from Dharmasala. Let me explain what this is all about. In 1959, as you know, the Chinese uh, invaded Tibet and made it an autonomous region of China. And it was a pretty brutal takeover, and uh, a lot of Tibetans fled, including the Dalai Lama. And they went over the Himalayas and wound up in, uh, in India, in different places in India, uh, particularly places that resembled the Himalayas because that's where they were from. The government in exile um, of Tibet wound up in a place called Dharmasala. That's what I'm going to talk about today. There are other Tibetans living in other places in India, but there's a lot of Tibetans living in Dharmasala. I don't know exactly the number. And they have sort of recreated their mother country. So what I'm going to show at 10.30 are pictures from Dharmasala. And then at 11, go to the pictures from Tibet, current Tibet, which is very different from the Tibet they left in 1959. And then um, at 11.30, <laughs> maybe, you can leave because you've seen this already, and then people who will come at 11 o'clock, uh, I can show the pictures of Dharmasala again because the contrast is very interesting. Dharmasala is a really a study in how refugees create their home country in a new country. I, I just stopped talking and show it to you. So Dharmasala uh, slash McLeod Ganj. McLeod Ganj is a small town, part of Dharmasala, where actually the Dalai Lama lives. Sometimes I appreciate, uh, uh, abbreviate the Dalai Lama as HHDL, because that's what they call him in India, His Holiness Dalai Lama. And the government of exile is there. He's no longer the political head of the government of exile, uh, government in exile. He's the religious head. And of course, he's the 14th Dalai Lama, and he calls himself the last Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you were there. Dalai Lama, as you know, came to UCSD a couple of months ago to give the commencement address. And then he spoke the day after. And uh, to celebrate that occasion, Ken and I did a documentary on the Dalai Lama. Well, it wasn't so much the Dalai Lama himself, but as more a story of uh, what happened to Tibet, how this government in exile came to be established in India. So then it occurred to me that since I was in both places, current Tibet and current Dharmasala, I would co put these slides together and show both of them today. So that's the long story of this. Uh, I was there at two different times in Tibet, one time in India, another time. So, um, okay, here we go. I think I've stopped talking. I turn the lights off, right? Okay. Do you know why he considers himself the last Dalai Lama? Yes. Yeah, I talked about that in that, uh, in that documentary. What was the question? Why does he consider himself the last Dalai Lama? As you probably know, the Dalai Lamas are picked from some children that seem like they would be eligible. And then they're given a test to see how much of their past life, which would have been the Dalai Lama's past life, they can actually remember. Hmm. And that's how this Dalai Lama was chosen. And they picked another one to succeed him. I can't remember. From where? Maybe from India, I'm not sure. That child was um, taken to Tibet to be educated as a Dalai Lama, but he was kidnapped by the Chinese and actually never heard from again. So we have no idea whether he's living or dead, even if he were living and he had been educated by the Chinese he would not be accepted by the Tibetan community at this point. But the Chinese picked another child to be the Dalai Lama, the 15th Dalai Lama, and that child's been educated in China. 
and he, of course, would never be accepted as the 15th Dalai Lama. So that's why the Dalai Lama considers himself the last one. And whether he will be replaced as the leader of the Tibetan people by somebody else or how that will work is not clear. Of course, the Tibetan people all, all over the world now, especially in mountainous places. I was in, uh, well, Boulder, Colorado is one. But a lot of small towns are Tibetan shops run by Tibetan people. I don't know what the population of um, the Tibetan, um, what's the word I'm looking for, diaspora is, but there are a lot of Tibetans who have fled and continue to flee. So when you see this, uh, these pictures from Dharmasala, which I took in 2006, so that was a while back, people are still coming from Tibet to India. And then conversely, people who come there a long time ago are having children who are Indians, of course, because they're born in India. So that's quite interesting. And how they preserve their culture here in Dharmasala, I found very interesting. As it was, I stumbled there on a week that was very important uh, to people in Dharmasala, well, to people all over the world, because it was the week that the Dalai Lama was given, given his teachings. So what he does is it's a huge outdoor auditorium. He gives his teachings in Tibetan. A lot of monks come from all over the world to hear them. And then you can buy or rent a radio that translates his Tibetan into English. So the translation was not too good. It was very crowded. And what surprised me, because I thought I had studied Buddhism fairly extensively in Japan, was that I didn't really understand what he was talking about. Um, Buddhism can be a very uh, mysterious and complicated religion. And a fairly obscure kinds of symbolism that he talked about, I really didn't have a clue. I think I learned about Buddhism from Alan Watts, and that's the simplified American version of Buddhism. And then I studied Buddhism in Japan for a year, but that got a little more complicated, but still it was Zen Buddhism. And there are, as in Christianity, a lot of sects of Buddhism. And Zen is like Quakerism is to Christianity, very simple. Uh, really not a theology as much as a belief system, and very few rituals and uh, some symbolism. But there are schools of Buddhism that are very complicated, and Tantric Buddhism is really what com comes out of Tibet, and it's very complicated with numerology and all kinds of things. So even though it was very exciting to be at the teachings uh, that the Dalai Lama gave, it was a little confusing because I didn't really know what he was talking about most of the time. Now, you now when you hear him talk about, he talks about love and brotherhood and all that kind of stuff, which we understand that. But that's not, it's his version of Buddhism, very nice version, but it's not the intricacies of the religion as some people practice them, especially in Tibet. The other thing that happened uh, after the teachings was a week of Tibetan opera. And you'll see that that was wonderful. That was really exciting. And meanwhile, you see these people in India now. I'm going to be showing people in India who are from Tibet. Some of them wearing the typical t Tibetan costumes, uh, many not. And then other people, like the monks who have come from other places uh, to hear the teachings. So, Bob, you had a question? <laughs> It's the government of Tibet in exile. Of course, there is a government of Tibet. Tibet is now an autonomous region of China. It's governed by the Chinese in Tibet. And you'll see that you know, at 11 o'clock. But um, the government of Tibet in exile is to preserve the Buddhist tradition and also to keep the diaspora together. The many Tibetans that have gone all over the world and those uh, Tibetans that are now living in Dharmasala and the Cloud Ganj. So it is a government to keep um, the 
idea of Tibet in people's minds and to support not necessarily secession from China, but to make sure that the autonomous part, uh, that the Chinese call it autonomous region, is, is autonomous, which it is not, of course, autonomous. Yeah, Penny. Uh, I assume that Dalai Lama is a title? Yes. What, what does that mean? Oh, I don't know. Good question. Somebody might know the answer to this. Lama is <laughs> like a head of something. The Dal I don't know. Anyway, he's he's carried that title's been carried for years, centuries. But he has a name. Yes, he does, which I don't know offhand. That's okay. John Smith or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Tenzin Gatso, I believe. Tenzin Gatso. I think it's in one of my slides, but thank you. That's right. Yeah. I think that's right. Given Okay. Let's go. Oh, so. This is uh, about Dharmasala, and then uh, McLeod Ganj is this little village, which you'll see. And this is essentially what I said. So, uh, Dharmasala and McLeod Ganj are very popular tourist destinations for tourists from all over the world. And I stayed, I don't know, by mistake or by design. I doubt it was by design because this trip was totally spontaneous. I was going from one place to another, not having any reservations. Somehow stumbled on this Chonner house, which to me is the most beautiful, charming, interesting place I've ever stayed in. <coughs> and I could spend the rest of my life there. I just thought it was just beautiful. When we go to Tibet, you'll see the Norbalinka Institute, which was a, a major cultural center in Tibet. But they have reinstated it now in uh, Dharmasala. And you'll see why I love this place. Hmm. Well, there are paintings uh, about Tibet from all, all over in every room. This is the Patola Palace, which will, I'm not saying that right, Potala Palace, which is the center of um, Lhasa the capital of Tibet. What, who lives there now, or what happens there? What's that? What happens there now? What happens now? Yeah, at that palace. It's it's on the palace. The, the palace is still there. You'll see it when I show the pictures of Tibet. These are paintings from the Chaner house in McLeod Ganj. So they have very talented artists. It's just amazing what they've done here. These are all paintings, reproductions of uh, the original Tibet. And the idea is to keep the idea of Tibet alive in these Tibetan refugees and their children and tourists who come to Dharmasala to find out about the government in exile. Um, I think these are refugees crossing the river. I think, I can't remember now, it was like a 12-day trip to cross from Tibet into Dharmasala in India, across the Himalayas. Of course, there's a yak. That's uh, Tibetan's uh, stable animal. You drink yak milk and yak everything. <laughs> yak milk, not too good. These are all paintings in the Chaner house. So I'm, uh, this is not Tibet, folks. This is where the Tibetan uh, government in exile is now in India, Dharmasala. And these are paintings from a hotel that I stayed in, recreating scenes from Tibet. So these are some of the monks. Some of these monks have come from Tibet, some of them from other parts of India, some from all over the world coming to hear the teachings by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Lots of souvenir shops, by the way. This is a community based in India. India is not a wealthy country, and some of the places in India are very poor. In my opinion, they've been very gracious about supporting Buddhism and many, many other religions in India without interference, and to some extent without much support. The roads in McLeod Ganj are not very good, they're okay. And you see things like this, this is an old Indian building, 
but you can see all the exposed wires and everything else, much like you see in other parts of India. So they don't get great service there, but they get the same service that any other city in India get, gets. This is another uh, painting in the Chonar house from Tibet, Tibetan horsemen. The Buddha, of course. This is a building, uh, I think, that houses the Tibetan Museum. It's a beautiful building. They've done a very good job of recreating some of these originally Tibetan buildings. That is a Tibetan Museum. Yeah. When you think of all the immigrants that have come to this country from their own countries and how hard some of them have tried to impart their um, culture and sometimes their language and their religion to their children, it's a very difficult struggle. And there's always problems in doing that. And by the third generation, generally, that home culture is lost. Some children still speak the language a little bit, eat the food. I think a lot of Jewish people still eat the food that, that, we, that our ancestors had in Russia. But, to, but to, to a great extent, the culture is lost. So they're, that's what they're trying to do here is through this museum and the paintings and everything else, preserve the culture. By the way, you can see on her uh, medallion the turquoise and coral jewelry. Tibetans were amazing in creating this jewelry. I was in a houseboat in India, um, and there were Tibetans selling a lot of things that on canoes that would come to the houseboat. And one of the things was jewelry. Unfortunately, I didn't buy any, but that's a beautiful medallion, hard to find. So mine is, by the way, um, a medallion that I bought in a Tibetan monastery in Australia. <laughs> I'm not sure who this man in the center is. I suspect he's the Chinese head of uh, Tibet now. The man standing, I think, is supposed to be a recreation of the His Holiness the Dalai Lama. That's a prayer wheel. Hi, come on in. <laughs> this is confusing. Sorry, guys, the notice said 10.30 and 11 o'clock, so I'm doing a show at 10.30 that I'll repeat at 11.30. Okay. So if you can find a seat. Are all there. <laughs> yeah, I know that she changed it finally. By the time she changed it, it was too late. <laughs> so that's a prayer wheel. We'll talk about that in a minute. And here's some uh, monks that come. It doesn't look like they're Tibetan monks that have come for the teachings. And this is one of the souvenir shops where you can find a lot of beautiful Buddhist and Tibetan things, like paintings. Like the sign things. on the shop say, the best way to pay? I don't know what that means, the best way to pay. Yeah. In English. Yeah, yeah, I think the whole thing is in English. Yeah. Well, English becomes the lingua franca of uh, that area because there's so many people from all over the world that come there. This is doing uh, the prayer wheels. You just spin them and the prayers go out. Um, <laughs> this is the usual problem of translating from one language to English. This was a temple um, in Dharmasala, right near where the Dalai Lama lives. And I wandered into it after the teachings and saw this sign. Of course, you would, um, sorry, you would take the, um, shoot, you would take your shoes off. Can you find your seat? I'm sorry, some people read the sign as 10.30, so we started at 10.30, but I'll repeat this part at 11.30. Okay. Yeah. So even the visitors to a Buddhist temple are not trustworthy. Okay, so this is a little bit of an explanation. This is a Mani prayer, well, I don't know what that means. It is filled with thousands of mantras. Om Amani Padme Hum. By turning this wheel once, one earns merit equal to the recitation of the mantras filled inside this wheel. Kindly turn it clockwise. May all beings find peace and happiness. Um, even though I talked about Zen Buddhism a minute ago, there is a lot, large part of Buddhism, like all religions, that are is rather superstitious. And doing the prayer wheel 
to me is superstition, to an Orthodox Buddhist would not be. I don't think it's any more superstitious than getting on your knees and saying a prayer to somebody that may or may not be listening. This is the same idea. Uh, I just took this, uh, a lot of women do hard labor in India. I just happened to catch this woman. These are not Tibetan women that are doing this. This is that uh, same uh, souvenir shop that we saw before. Millie was reading the top part. It says, free Tibet, <laughs> new mementos from India, a house of antiques and cottage, and, uh, cottage handicrafts, the best way to pay, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> Are there any seats over here? I can't see. Yes, there are one. Seats on this side? There's one here. There's one over here. And one over here. One over here. here. Okay, the next time somebody comes, we can show them the seats. Uh, this is the big. Some of these are out of order. This is the beginning of Tibetan Opera Week. They created a big stage in a... In a area, I'm not sure what's usually in that area, but it's a fairly large area. It's the 12th uh, Opera Festival in 2006. And there's a picture of His Holiness in the middle there. I'll repeat some of this at 11.30 because I had to. We were told it starts at 11. I know. And some people were told it starts at 10.30. So just to keep people entertained, I'm talking about Dharmasala in India which is the government uh, of Tibet in exile. So f for this section, you'll be seeing India, Dharmasala, India. This is uh, the setup for the Tibetan opera. It was really exciting. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing this white scarf that Buddhists wear, uh, especially in the presence of the Dalai Lama. And uh, so this is an authentic one that I got there. You can see some of these outfits are very elaborate. They are from Tibet, carefully preserved or recreated. Again, to pass on the culture to people from Tibet who are second generation, third generation now. I didn't uh, make an audio recording of this, but it's very uh, exciting music. You can see these little kids dressed up in their Tibetan outfits. And on the back is a mural, uh, sort of a Buddhist mural. And you can see in the front a lot of people who are not uh, Tibetans or Indians there, like me. These costumes. Uh, when I when we showed the pictures from Tibet at 11 o'clock, uh, when I went there, it was Tibetan New Year's, which meant that people were coming from all over Tibet. And um, in their costumes from their own villages. And that's what these are. That's what they're wearing that you, uh, <coughs> that are recreated probably in uh, India. Ordinarily, you wouldn't see all these people, but when I was in Tibet, they were there because of the holiday. She looks like Carmen Miranda, right? <laughs> <laughs> these are some of the masks and uh, more costumes from there. Again, the white scarf. When is the Tibetan New Year? Is it the same as Chinese New Year? No, it was very interesting that when I was there, I think on this visit, I celebrated Western New Year's. I was in uh, Shanghai, and there was a big celebration, December 31st. And then a month later, I was in Tibet. No, yeah, I was in Tibet, which you'll see at 11 o'clock, and celebrated Tibetan New Year's. And then uh, a month later, I was in the southern part of China and celebrated what New Year's was that? Another New Year's anyway. Lunar. Remember. What? Probably the Lunar. Lunar New Year, yeah. I can't remember what the third New Year's was. 
Oh, the third New Year's was Chinese New Year's. Yeah. Of course, there's pictures of the Dalai Lama all over the place, which you will not see in my slides from Tibet. Uh, I was just in Lhasa, actually, not to hold country. But uh, any pictures of the Dalai Lama are forbidden in Tibet. So here's some young people. This guy with the green shirt, I think he is symptomatic of the younger generation. He looked very cynical to me, like this was not his holiday, this was not his opera. Here he is. Uh, there's an entrance from which these people are emerging in their costumes. And here he is looking at these people. And you can imagine what he must be feeling, assuming that he's a kid born here in India, knowing nothing about the Tibetan culture except what his parents and the community pass on to him. And he's seeing these people emerge in outfits that they don't usually wear, uh, celebrating their uh, heritage from Tibet. And he's looking wondrously to me, or cynically, saying, what are these people wearing this month? And you can imagine that happening in, in America all the time, people cherishing their native costumes and then the younger generation sort of sneering at that tradition. This little girl on the left, uh, well, boy on the left, but this girl in the middle was a very sophisticated little girl, spoke English very well. Here she is. Some of these pictures are, uh, people are not wearing their native costumes so much as they um, are wearing what they wear on the outskirts, living somewhere in India where there are not that many Tibetan refugees. This is obviously was a gym. There's the mural you saw in the background before. People, yeah, people, it's a whole week long uh, opera. So people bring their lunch and their dinners and come in families and celebrate. So this man on the left is a sort of typical looking Tibetan man. He's a monk. You would see him, some people like him in Tibet. But the young woman on the right seems to me to be um, first generation Indian trying to maintain her traditions. I'm just reading into it what I see, because she's young enough to have been born in, in India, still wearing Tibetan costume, and looking to me very Indian. And there's no prohibition on intermarriage. I'm sure the Tibetan families would like their kids to marry um, Tibetans, but those Things are very hard to control, the intermarriage of the second generation. We're talking about the big sick, Penny and I were talking about that new movie about a Pakistani man who falls in love with an American woman. And that, for the first generation, is very hard to take. These are typical Tibetan women. Yeah, he's got a huge earring in his ear. Um, I met Victoria at, at my hotel. We were both using the internet at the same time. We got to talking and she turns out to have been an expat, a woman from Virginia, I think, or I can't remember where she's from, who's been living in Lhasa now for years in this little apartment right in the middle of the Himalayas. And she has a big sign that she created on her patio that says, Tibet lives. She uh, got to know a lot of the people in the government of exile of Tibet and was trying to be very helpful. She has since moved away, but she, uh, now she lives in Washington, D.C., but she lived there for a number of years, maybe 10 years. And she was very helpful. She introduced me to a lot of people there and showed me a lot of places where uh, expats go to see an American movie, for example. A lot of little places like, like that, and interesting food places. 
Here's the Himalayas, as you can see from her apartment. The contrast here is not good, but there is snow in the background. <coughs> so then it was uh, time to go, and I went to the bus station. It was a challenge to find the right bus. I had decided to go to, well, and uh, a lot of the monks were leaving because the teachers were over and they didn't, some of them didn't stay for the Tibetan opera. Is there an extra seat around somewhere? No. Here. Two seats. One here. And one here. here. Um, so the monks were very helpful in getting the bus loaded. I loved to ride buses in India. Loved it. I don't do it anymore because I inhaled too much particulates and got bronchitis after the last, not the last trip, but the one before that. But it's so much fun to see who comes off and comes on and what they're wearing and what they're saying. And it's just wonderful. I just love it. So this bus was, um, it didn't go, I was going to Amritsar in the Punjab. This bus didn't go all the way through, but people came in and out that were so interesting. It was amazing. Wedding parties and everything. And this is some of the scenery on the way out of uh, McLeod Ganj. And this is an Indian bus, so we could tell right away that we were back in India. <laughs> and onward to Amritsar, the Golden Temple and the spiritual home of the Six, which uh, someday we can show those slides again because to me that's so interesting. I loved Amritsar, but then I love everything, so I'm not very discriminating. But So now, for the people who came at 11 o'clock, uh, we're going to Tibet. And that was a different visit, a very interesting visit that I had done on the road back from Bhutan, well, not exactly, but uh, started in the Himalayas. And uh, if people said, you should really see Chandigarh, then I went to Chandigarh. And then people said, you should really take the train to Shimla. And I did that. Wonderful. It was really great. And then uh, it was fairly obvious that, um, no, what am I talking about? That was a different, that was the trip that led to India. But this is a trip to Tibet, which was the end of my uh, stay in China, in uh, Kunming for three months. So, um, let's see where we start here. Here are some Tibetan children. So now we're really in Tibet. For the people who came in late, I started the show, which at 10.30 because of the mix-up with lifestyles. Um, the Tibetan refugees, I said this before, the people who were here, many of them fled to India. And the government of Tibet in exile landed in Dharmasala, which is a Himalayan town. And that's where the Dalai Lama now lives, where he went uh, when he was a child, even. Oh, they moved from one city to, to eventually to Dharmasala. So those are the pictures I just showed, and I'll show them again at 11.30. But this is uh, contemporary Tibet, I think in 2006. And it's changed a lot. Uh, China took it over in 1959, so it looks, it has serious elements of China in there. Uh, but some of the, um, Tibetan buildings and practices are still going on. So this was Tibetan New Year's, so a lot of the people came from all over the country in their costumes. Uh, you can see in the upper left, I have a pointer, but uh, all these different um, language groups and um, ethnic groups that comprise China now, and Tibetan is in the upper left-hand purple corner there. The interesting, well, I'll talk about Kunming some other time, but that was uh, in Yunnan province, where there are 26 different national groups, but that's another story. So Tibet is on the Tibetan plateau, uh, northern side of the Himalayas, now an autonomous region of China, nicknamed the Roof of the World. And Mount Everest actually is, uh, belongs to both Nepal and Tibet. 
Lhasa is the capital. This is really all I went to was Lhasa and the site of the Potala Palace where the Dalai Lamas lived uh, their winter home and the Jokong Temple, uh, Tibet's spiritual heart, revered for its golden statue of the young Buddha, which I can't say I saw that. But there's a yak in its finest clothing, all dressed up. Uh, there's another picture of Tibet, which you can see is a very substantial part of China. And the, just, there's India right here. Well, so it's next to Jason country through Nepal, but still quite a long trek. So um, what surprised me, uh, a lot of us have come flown from uh, a northern city in China. Can't think of the name of it right now. And it was really cold there. So we got all bundled up, got on this little small plane, and landed in Lhasa. And it was not cold. It was quite temperate. So this is a little uh, weather thing. Due to its very high elevation, Lhasa has a monsoon influence, warm, summer, humid, continental climate. It closely borders a cool, semi-arid climate, etc. And that, all that explains why it was not uh, that cold. There's the Potala Palace. It is really unforgettable once you've seen it. Now you've seen it, so um, it was the winter residence of the Dalai Lamas. And it dates back to the 7th century AD. To say nothing of anything else, it's an amazing engineering feat. And this is the context of modern day uh, Lhasa. It rises 13 stories. Um, it contains more than a thousand rooms. It is open to pilgrims and tourists. Three stories, uh, well, magnificent chapels, golden stupas, and prayer halls. It began during, uh, in 18, 1645, and it took uh, more than 50 years with the laborers and the artisans to complete. Uh, Joan Lai sent his own troops to protect it from the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution that was very far-sighted of them because this is really a world landmark. This is where I stayed at the Yak Hotel. <laughs> Actually, it was very nice. No yaks. Here again is the palace in the context of modern-day Lhasa. And this is the Jokhang Monastery, which is adjacent to um, the palace. And Buddha, uh, Tibetans consider this temple as the most sacred and important temple in Tibet. The architectural style is a mixture of Indian, Tibetan, and Nepalese design. Founded in 652 and has been enlarged and uh, renovated by the fifth Dalai Lama in 1610. So you can see the tradition of the Dalai Lamas goes back a long time. <coughs> People have been in Bhutan, remember my pictures from Bhutan, see a similarity between this architecture and the Bhutanese, which is not very far away, actually. Um, so during the Chinese development of Lhasa, the Barker Square in front of the temple was encroached. Well, that's putting it mildly, yeah. During the Cultural Revolution, Red Guards attacked the Jokhang Temple in 1966, and for a decade there was no worship there. Renovation of Jokhang took place from 1972 to 1980. In 2000, Jokhang became a UNESCO World Heritage Site as an extension of the Potala Palace. There were a lot more monks there then than there are now. Um, the monasteries have been essentially emptied or reduced to a few hundred, where there used to be several thousand. Um, so it's also the center of the commercial activity in the city with a maze of streets radiating from it. and. These slides are not in great order, but a lot of the commercial activities now you'll see, and they're interesting because of what they sell, and also because of who's there. Uh, many monks shop there, which surprised me for some reason. 
And many of these uh, people who've come from all over Tibet for the Tibetan New Year are there in their outfits. And there's a walkway around the marketplace for people to circumnavigate the Jokar Temple. And that's why they have come there. That is a religious rite, sort of like going to Mecca. It takes about 20 minutes if you don't stop, but most people stop and uh, pray on their knees there. You can see some of these outfits that you would not probably ordinarily see in Lhasa because these people have come from different parts of the, of the country. This is uh, me in my costume. This is interestingly, I was in another part of China and there was a North Face store there and I figured North Face is made in China anyway. This would be a good place to get an outfit to wear in Tibet. So this is my Chinese North Face outfit. And that's uh, part of the Jokhar. No, part of the, some temple in the background, sorry. So this is what I wanted you to see, these outfits. So interesting. And they're buying things for the uh, Tibetan New Year. A lot of the pictures I took were in the backs of people because their outfits were so interesting and also because they didn't like to have their pictures taken, so I had to sneak up on them. Is a woman with a scarf across her face, is that usual? Uh, yes, so Millie's saying this woman with a scarf across her face. Yeah. Um, at some point we're going to see some the Muslim area of Lhasa. And she, it's possible that she's a Muslim. It's also possible that some of these uh, Orthodox Tibetan Buddhists cover their face, and it's a good question. I'm not sure which it is. These are some of the monuments outside of Lhasa. The Chinese flag, by the way, you notice that. And I didn't see this. I, I stole this from Google because really I didn't see Tibet. <coughs> I only saw Lhasa, and Tibet is a huge country and very beautiful um, places where you can see the Himalayas snow-covered. Well, actually they were snow-covered when I was there, and yaks. Uh, Mount Everest is one of the big features that brings people to Tibet, and in droves. <laughs> Again, I didn't see this, but that's how crowded it is on Mount Everest. And those are the people who made it up to that point. A lot of people don't make it. So the international border between China and Nepal run across Mount uh, Everest Summit Point. And there's a, a map of that. It's sort of interesting how that works. So these are some of the shopping streets uh, around the Bokhar Temple, Bokhar Place. And some of these things are Buddhist um, things and some of them are staples of everyday life. It's very interesting to shop like this. There are plenty of Chinese shops around, regular shops that you and I would shop in. You'll see a Chinese department store. But this was really fun to shop like this. Um, I went into a jewelry and antiquities store and they took me up to the third floor. They have beautiful things in there. I didn't buy anything, but I did find out that this wonderful necklace that I got in Australia is not very authentic. But, anyway, um, but from the third floor, this is a view of what's going on in the marketplace. And also people um, going around the temple. You can see incense and uh, lots of other Buddhist ritual things that you can buy there. Ah, that woman is carrying that thing. I don't know anything about this, but it looked brutal. I could make up the fact that she's coming from Tibet, but I don't think that's true. I think if you come from Tibet as a refugee, you travel pretty light. These are some of the goodies that you can get. Somehow I think her face is a typical Tibetan face, but there's plenty of them. More goodies. Are those dried food or candies? Yes, yeah, some of them are dried fruit, some of them are candies. 
Leachy nuts. Leachy nuts, yeah. I don't know how much of this is imported from India. If you see candy like this in Bhutan, you know it's imported from India because they don't make stuff like this. This might be too. <laughs> now there's a thief. Now this person, woman's face is covered, I think, to protect her from germs, I think. It's quite a load. So there's a woman with a prayer wheel. She looks like an Orthodox Buddhist. You know, Tibetan Buddhism is different from regular Buddhism. It's, it's, it is more mysterious and um, more trending toward orthodoxy. I love these things. I don't know how I restrain. Oh, I restrained myself because I had a lot of places to go after this. But. <laughs> Uh, these rugs now are made in Tibet. They look like it's really cold out, and I can't remember it being that cold. Um, momos, of course, are the food of the Himalayas, so you see them all over the Himalayas, including uh, the state of Georgia, for example. I had a lesson on how to make momos there. I had a lesson on how to make momos in Bhutan. And here's momos in Tibet, which of course, not surprising. Here are dumplings. Are they? Dumplings, essentially oh, dumplings. Mm. They're boiled, uh, not steamed, not fried, boiled. So Tibet is nearly a quarter of China's <laughs> territory. That's a lot. And of course, it explains why China would be interested in Tibet, plus the minerals that are there are very valuable. These are people, to me, obviously, from the villages, but what do I know? Some pretty good cheese, and meat, and fish, and more wonderful textiles. These police uh, have a hard time, I think. They're Chinese. Tibetans don't like them. They often do things to uh, stir them up. You'll see in Tibetan New Year's what happens. Okay, so these are some of the pilgrims that are circumnavigating the temple. And um, I, don't, I don't have a video of this, but a lot of people do this by on their knees. They may make the entire pilgrimage on their knees. Sometimes they have knee pads, sometimes they don't. I think this man had a hand pad. It's a difficult way to walk around. Or walking is on uh, two feet. But um, this is the uh, closest I think they can come to this temple. And to have um, come here is a um, big thing. Again, like going to Mecca. Here's people from the villages wearing their different attire. And some Chinese stores. There's a stupa in the middle there. Good shopping here. These are hats. Um, and these are typical, oh, I think I showed this, but no. So these are people in front of the uh, temple, mostly on their knees. And sometimes they spend the whole day there. At least we saw people there for a long time. And sometimes they have mats that they uh, do that on. Again, the prayer wheels. This is an instrument, <laughs> wonderful Himalayan instrument. Looks like something you see in Switzerland. <laughs> Painting on a temple, I think. Not sure who he was. And some designs on the buildings themselves. A totem, 
Oh, I don't know if it's totems or not. By the way, you can see people are not living very wealthy, wonderfully in Lhasa. But for many, it's a big uh, relief from living in Tibet, which they don't like the Chinese control. I mean, no, that's, this is Tibet, no. <laughs> so this is how they live. Here's some more of those instruments. And beautiful uh, handwork. You can see the snow-covered mountains. These are for real in the back of this temple. And these uh, interesting architectural touches are very typical Tibetan or Buddhist anyway. These are prayer flags wrapped around the stupa. And these are the uh, like surfboards that propel people who are doing this kneeling, um, walking. This is a Chinese department store, very modern. You can see the Tibet printing on top and the Chinese at the bottom. Again, photo of house. Um, here is, um, is this elephant guy. But this is a Hindu god. And of course, um, not of course, but I think the Hindus are uh, permitted to practice there if there are any in Tibet. This is a Chinese department store. Of course, there's beautiful jewelry here and Chinese things. You can see jade in the background. As you know, there's been an import of Han Chinese to work in Tibet. There's now a train that goes directly from China to Tibet. So that increases the import of uh, non-Tibetan people. Tibetans resent it, but the Chinese argue that they have brought a lot of civilized uh, characteristics to Tibet. The shopping, the restaurants, the hotels, uh, transportation, streets. So there is that argument to be made. Here's a nice recreation park, a stupa. Nice street, very nice street. Nice monument, I'm not sure what that is. Um, this is, again, it's not my slide, but just to mention the economy of Tibet is dominated by subsistence agriculture. The tourism has become a growing industry in recent decades. I heard uh, before I went to China to live that it was very hard to get a visa to go to Tibet. But through different uh, machinations, a lot of us managed to get Tibetan visas, and it wasn't that hard. It cost something, but it wasn't that mysterious. Here's some buildings, government buildings, I think. Uh, this is just to show you again the difference between the uh, written language. Well, I'm sure the spoken language, too. This is Chinese, and uh, that's Tibetan. No. That's Chinese. Oh, and this is Tibet. So you can see it's quite it's quite a different language. Uh, Greater Tibetan is spoken by approximately six million people, and that includes the diaspora too. So 150,000 exile speakers who fled from modern day to Tibet still speak this Greater Tibetan. Uh, and the written language that I just showed you is consistent even though the spoken language has its dialects. She is all bent over. Um, I had 
heard something about the Drapen Monastery, and so I went there on my own. I had heard that there was a recent purge there, that a lot of the monks were killed, that um, also this um, interesting fact that it's um, since the 1950s, Drapun Monastery, along with its peers in other parts of uh, India, by the way, have lost much of their independence and spiritual cred credibility in the eyes of Tibetans since they operate under the close watch of the Chinese security services. I don't know if that's true or not. The monastery is the largest of all Tibetan monasteries and is in the western suburb of Lhasa. It was founded in 1416. We don't know anything about these dates, <laughs> but it was a long time ago. And so there are about 300 monks there. Uh, as opposed to what used to be about 8,000 monks. And the Chinese have capped the population there. Um, the campuses are, other campuses are in India, uh, on land given by Nehru, actually, to the Tibetan community in exile. And the monasteries in India house over 5,000 celibate monks with about 3,000 at Drepa, another place in um, India. But here there's only 300 monks. So um, what I had understood about this place was on the very top is a room with pictures and statues of all the former Dalai Lamas. So that's where I was trying to go. I'm sorry these pictures are a little mixed up because I wanted to show you the steps so you'll see. A lot of steps to get up there. And I was sort of halfway through and I was practically crawling because I was so tired and the steps were steep. And I looked back and there was this monk down at the bottom and he was saying, go, go on, you know. So I did. The monks were very friendly. Ah, sorry, these are out of order. This is that part of Lhasa that has, the, uh, uh, that has Muslims. I was shocked, I, I stumbled into, the, no, I didn't stumble into, I read about it in Lonely Planet, so I went there. And it's a big Muslim community. There's a mosque in the background. Uh, Tibetan uh, Muslims wearing their caps, uh, hats. And they've lived there for a long time. And they have their own tradition, their own food, clothing. And they've been there since the 11th century. It was quite an interesting part of town had a Muslim lunch. This is, sorry, this is a painting in the Drapung Monastery. And these kids come from somewhere, but I'm not sure what that symbol means. Is that something, I don't know. The teacher is like this, this one this means the teacher. Okay. What's the two fingers mean? Could be the piece, but it's all, you know, kids just going, but I yeah. think the, if they're oh, this this one you're talking about the three mudra, yeah. they aren't all symbolic of things. I'm not clear. Thank them. you. Hand so you can mudra. see that on statues of the Buddha, where yeah, the, the fingers mudra. are arranged in certain yeah. positions. I talked about another presentation. Now I've yeah. forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. So sweet. This is also from the Drepung Monastery. Very colorful. It's beautiful. Beautiful works. Oh, I'm sorry. Back to the monks, the uh, Muslims again. Gotta do better with this presentation here. He's a little Muslim guy. Cute. A clothing store. Where you can get beautiful materials. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So this is the stairway I was taking when I saw that monk telling me to go on. <laughs> it's not that they're steep, it's that they're so narrow, I guess. And on the way up, I encountered these guys who were going down. <laughs> and prayer wheels, of course. And there's an entrance. So this is a bird's eye view of what goes on in the monastery. Of course, they have laundry just like everybody else. 
this is a view from up there with that you can see the prayer flags, but you can also see the Himalayas. They love color, don't they? Yes. Yeah. No, he said they love color. Yes. I like the architecture. More stairs. Here's a monk the coming down. Is very colorless. Oh, here's the marketplace That's again. Yeah. The monastery again. Some interesting frescoes on the walls. Oops, the marketplace again. Oh, sorry. You can get beautiful things in the marketplace. I must have gotten some things. These people have come in, you know, from the remote areas of Tibet, so they're anxious to do their shopping while they're there. And you see the, uh, you know, what was appropriated by the sign, the Nazi sign, but that's an old Indian uh, sign. Nothing to do with Nazis. Um, again, uh, the Tibetan Muslims, I think I said that already. Is the Tibetan so, language distinct from Chinese? Yes. Can they interpret back and forth? No, I think you have to learn how to speak Chinese to speak it. It's not that easy transliterating from one to another. It's two distinct languages. Two distinct. And the yeah. currencies are distinct? No, now it's the uh, yuan. It's the Chinese currency that's used now in Tibet. Oh. Tibet's now part of China. Yeah. Now that is a typical village outfit that you wouldn't see if you weren't there for the Tibetan New Year's, I'm sure. This is a Chinese guest house. Chinese department store. Oops. Well, that's her again. Um, while I was circumnavigating the Potala Palace, on the lower level, some of the Tibetans seemed very rude, I don't know. And I don't know what they were trying to tell me, that I didn't belong there or whatever it was. So I took their pictures. They didn't like that. <laughs> so I sort of stuck to the back of them and could get these outfits, which were really interesting. Is that a question? Uh, what does what the Tibet smell like? Smell like? Mm -hmm. Is was that the question? Lot, was there a lot of odor? Oh, the odors on the street. Yeah, they were wonderful spices and things like that. Years ago, they had a, a water problem in Tibet. With a smell? Well, there were smells because of the water problem. Oh, because of the water problems. And uh, I'm assuming that they're they now have. I didn't smell anything. My hotel, of course, was quite comfortable. <laughs> they got their tomatoes. Again, a lot of musical instruments. I didn't hear as much Tibetan music as I would like to. This is a very typical window treatment in many parts of um, the Buddhist world, anyway, certainly in Bhutan. And a very beautiful light a light a fixture. So there's Chinese stores here, Tibetan stores. Uh, most of the open air stuff is Tibetan. So there was uh, independence from China in 1913, but. Um, Maintain, they maintained their autonomy until 1951. 
and I showed that in that uh, documentary that we showed about Tibet. There were car um, carriages you could go around in. This is another painting uh, somewhere. This is a marketplace <clears throat> that I, I assume the Chinese had built for the Tibetan people because there's something very similar in uh, the northern part of China where the Uyghurs are. It's a very good place to shop. There's the steps again. Okay, getting up the drape from the monastery. I will there someday. Um, okay. So on the way up to the top floor of the monastery, I saw these, I guess this is a monk that I saw here. It became clearer later on. But these are where the monks live. Here's a monk. I'm not sure whether he's cleaning the windows or what's going on there. Putting up the curtains. Here's another monk doing something else. So this is the top floor that I had been struggling to reach. And there are statues and pictures of the former Dalai Lamas. And uh, the 14th Dalai Lama is not there. And you don't have a picture of him there, and you're not allowed to have a picture of him there, or any place else. So Beijing rejects the Dalai Lama's call for a middle way solution of a semi-autonomous Tibet under Chinese rule and accuses him and his supporters of campaigning to split Tibet from the rest of China. The Dalai Lama denies that. He says he's okay with the autonomous region, just would like more autonomy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it wasn't until I got to um, India that I saw pictures of the Dalai Lama. I mean, uh, the 14th Dalai Lama. And these are the others, or not. It's a beautiful room up there. It was worth a climb. Not sure what that is. Those are offerings. Uh, debate is uh, one way of training Buddhist monks. I didn't see this debate, but this was an old picture of when there were 8,000 Buddhist monks there and practicing their de debate technique. Here's a real monk. My understanding was that many monks fairly recently had been killed or ousted from the monastery by the Chinese, maybe because they had involved the 14th Dalai Lama something. There's murals all over the place, Buddhist uh, mythology. There's somebody doing something there. These are very pretty. Prayer flags that had fallen. Oh. So on the way down, I struggled down, <laughs> and there was a it was a would have been a long walk back to the city, and I didn't know. I guess I must have gotten there by bus. I don't remember. Anyway, these monks offered me a ride on the truck into the city, which I gratefully accepted. You speak English? Yeah, enough. Get on, you know. <laughs> um, this little park, which I showed part of before. Uh, have it has his little uh, stands. So roasted barley, yak meat, and butter tea are the staple foods in Tibet. 
And there were plenty of authentic Tibet Tibetan restaurants to sample those. What is butter tea? It's a yak butter in tea. It's an acquired taste, I would say. <laughs> so this was fun to sit here, and it was very peaceful. Oh, here's the monk offering me a ride on the truck. <laughs> These are so out of order. I'm so sorry. Hmm. A little dressmaker shop so you could see which kind of outfit you wanted. Her headdress is very interesting. There's our friends, our poster children. I'm sure they have it some troubles adjusting to either being Chinese or Tibetan. Oh, this is a wonderful headdress that she has. I think it's a she, with turquoise and coral in it. Here she is again. You know, I just showed those pictures from Papua New Guinea in which these would have been cassowary feathers, but I think this is real hair. Some meat. Um, I suspect this was in the Buddha in the Muslim part, because the Buddhists don't eat meat generally. Yeah, this is all I think in the Muslim part. Dentist's office. These are people who have come to worship. It's very nice in the middle of uh, Lhasa. Cannot fault the Chinese for not making it a very um, livable uh, place with good transportation. Here's somebody with their prayer wheel. Isn't she nice? <laughs> Again, the Carl and the uh, turquoise. Surprised to see him, <laughs> all dressed up in his Buddhist outfit. I'm not good at distinguishing between Tibetans and Chinese, but I suspect he's Chinese, but I don't know. So a lot of the pilgrims had come to sit under the prayer wheels. Another view of the Potol Palace. So I was enjoying this park, and um, talking. To, I talked to him for a while, an interesting young Tibetan, I think Tibetan man who spoke pretty good English. There weren't many people in the park. And I talked to her for a long time. She's Tibetan. I forget her story, but she um, was sympathetic toward Chinese rule, not anxious to emigrate to India. Great. Very smart young woman. Nice fire engine. Chinese provide. See that Chinese do provide the uh, basics of the of the uh, government there. For some reason, I stumbled on this Western bakery. It even had a happy birthday cake there. <laughs> It's not Tibetan food, I don't think. This is more like it. This is ducks. <laughs> Make Peking ducks from these guys. <laughs> My friends climbing the steps. So those are not yaks, of course, they're sheep. 
Oh, so Chinese New Year was something like uh, January 31st. It's a lunar calendar, so it's not every year that way. And I didn't want to go out on the streets. It was wild. The Ch Chinese New Year's, the Tibetan New Year's, a lot of firecrackers. Very noisy and seems to me sort of dangerous. I was in, uh, well, for Chinese New Year's, I was in the way far south in the city there. And, it, and I was on the streets. And there were firecrackers going all over the place. So this is the view from my hotel. And it seemed to me they were provoking the police by setting fires in the middle of the street. So the Chinese police had to come and put them out. Just my interpretation. This is another mural. So goodbye, Nasa. And now, of course, before I, after I was there, is a now a very modern train that leaves from somewhere in China. I can't remember where. It goes over the Himalayas right to Lhasa. And that's going over the Himalayas. So those people who didn't see the pictures from Dharmasala.